Thank you so much. Thank you for a really uh, great personal introduction. So much better than just reading off a, a list of books and things like that. So I sure appreciate you being here today. Though. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, there's so many uh, people in the audience, that, uh, so many uh, artists that I admire in the audience, writers and filmmakers, and people of all different kinds that make art that inspire me and influence me. But I do have to point out one person in particular, and that's Helen Lewis. I'm so moved that she's here. She's one of my heroes in so many ways. Uh, thank you, Helen. <laughs> at Berea College and that job wouldn't, my job wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Helen. She paved the way in Appalachian Studies in so many other ways. So I'm really honored for her to be here. And so many, uh, all of you, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for all of you. Um, and I want to especially thank Ben Jennings for working to get me here and everybody at the library. And of course, Jim Cooper for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Can you hear me okay back there? I'm going to tell you a little bit about Southernmost, and then I'm going to read a little bit, and then I, I hope that we can have a little conversation, so I hope you'll ask me some questions and we can talk. Um, this book um, starts about three years ago and four days ago, and I know that because it starts on June 26, 2015. That's the day that marriage equality was passed by the Supreme Court, and that's the day the book starts. Um, when the book starts, Asher Sharp is a preacher in his late 30s who for the past 10 years has been doing a lot of self-examination because his brother came out to him 10 years ago. He rejected him in a terrible way. And so for the next 10 years he's been really uh, thinking about that and um, evolving on that. <clears throat> he's been reading a lot of Thomas Merton and listening to a lot of Patty Griffin. And those two things especially have an impact on him and, and how he changes and the way he thinks about empathy. Um, so, on the day marriage equality passes, when a devastating flood hits his little town, um, it sets some things into motion. First of all, a gay couple who has been living quietly in the community, their house is swept away and they come to his house seeking shelter and his wife turns them away because they're a gay couple. The other thing is that the congregation starts to blame the loss of their homes and this awful flood on, um, on the decision of the Supreme Court. So this leads Asher to think to himself, I've been thinking about this for 10 years, it's time for me to act. So he stands up and gives a very heartfelt, heartfelt sermon to his congregation and they fire him and his wife divorces him and he loses custody of his little boy. So all of that is the impetus for him kidnapping his little boy and running off to Key West, Florida. Um, and so in this scene, they're on their way to Key West. And one thing I'm, I'm only telling people at readings at events like this is I never really talk about symbols in my books or anything like that, mainly because I don't really I'm not conscious of symbols and metaphors when I'm writing the book. I think they only work if they rise up on their own, if they're organic. It's not something you can really maneuver. In this book, the, symbol, the, the metaphor was so plain to me after I finished it that I just want to briefly point it out. And that's the dogs in this book always represent the presence of the divine. And so, that made perfect sense to me when the book was finished that that happened because I thought when I'm with my dogs, or any dog really, I feel like I'm in the presence of real goodness, you know? And so to me, that pure goodness is the best metaphor for the divine, or God, or the God of your understanding, however you want to put it. So you'll see that a little bit in this scene. Justin is Asher's little boy. He's nine years old at this point. Asher sat by the window watching the trees. There were thirsty looking pines and short little palm trees and the parking lot blacktop was covered with a thin layer of sand that had blown in sometime when there was actually a breeze. The trees were completely still in a way they never were back home in Tennessee. 
He didn't see a single bird. Maybe they were way back in the deepest parts of the woods where the pine shade was cool and fragrant, a better place for winging things than out by the treeless interstate where it was nothing but rotting motels and truck stops. They were in a motel near the Florida-Georgia border. Asher had driven more than eight hours before he started falling asleep. He had coasted into the Shady Oaks Motel, got in a room, and had dived into a hard sleep after making Justin swear to not leave. He had fallen asleep to the sound of his son watching the TV, but now he was awake after only a couple of hours, and Justin's small snores were singing across the room to him. At least the room offered those two hours of sleep. There was a rust stain on the floor around the toilet, and the bar of soap was thin as a Hershey bar. It smelled like funeral flowers. The towels were like sandpaper. He was pretty sure there was a dried vomit on the carpet, and Justin had said the remote felt sticky. It's perfect that the word shady is in this motel's name, <laughs> Justin had said. Asher clicked off the television, and now he sat on the air conditioner at the window. He could see as an old dog moseyed across the parking lot. If he were a dog, Asher thought, he'd be crawling up under a cool porch somewhere, getting off that hot black top. There was something pitiful about the dog. Asher reckoned he probably hadn't had a bath his whole life. He was black and white, but everything about him had been grayed by dirt. The dog stopped and sniffed at the air. Maybe he was out hunting food, too hungry to be lounging around under a porch. And then he turned and set his eyes right on Asher's. The dog's tongue lolled out, and it seemed to Asher that he had no idea what his next move might be, as if he had exhausted all of his options for survival. Asher padded into the bathroom and filled a thin plastic cup with water. He slipped out of the moldy room and onto the sidewalk where a dozen air conditioners leaked thin streams that ran in jagged lines down the concrete. The heat was thick as curtains. Night was fixing to slide over the world, and the cicadas were calming down for that hush time between daylight and dark when crickets rise in their boughs. That was what happened in the deepest parts of the pine woods. Out here by the motel, there was only the sound of 18 wheelers groaning down the interstate, one after another, an endless noise of commerce. The dog lay with his back legs splayed out and his front paws tucked under his chest now. Asher put his hand out so the old boy could draw in his scent. Hey there, buddy, Asher said. He set the cup on the sidewalk and the dog glanced up at him to make sure it was a gift and then his tongue lashed at the water as if his full thirst had only now overtaken him. Asher tipped the cup to the side for him to get more, and the dog stared as he lapped it up. The whole time his eyes were saying, thank you so much, that's the best damn water I've ever had in my whole damn life. <laughs> then the dog was going crazy, licking Asher's hand and jumping up so he would squat down and give his full attention. He smelled like he'd rolled around in something dead and rotten. Asher petted him anyway. The dog looked like beagle, pit bull, maybe some mountain feist. He had a strong chest and a noble head, a slender but muscular body, despite his obvious hunger. Asher patted down the dog's back and he could feel pebbles under his skin that he thought was bird shot. Asher sat down on the grass and let the dog cover him up with loving. He didn't care how badly he stank. The dog climbed into his lap and licked at his face, perching one of his paws upon Asher's chest. And this was the first time Asher had been really happy in a long while. Yes, sir, buddy, that's a good boy. Yes, it is, Asher sang song to him. And the dog seemed to talk back by the way he wiggled around and licked Asher's hands and face when he could sneak in a kiss. Here he was, Asher Sharp, on the run from the law. He had sold him his little boy, and he knew right then and there there was no way he was leaving this good old boy behind. <laughs> so I, I told you a little
little bit about the issue that's the impetus for everything, but for me the book is mostly about the relationship between Asher and his little boy Justin, and what a special little boy Ash, or Justin is. He's a, a strange, overly sensitive little boy that's really not made for this world, and Asher wants to preserve that as long as he can. And, um, really what Justin is is just so full of empathy that it's really hard to live in a world that seems often so devoid of it. Um, and of course, you know, the, I have two children and the main thing that I eventually realized the, about parenthood is that as a parent I have absolutely no power and no control. And you go you go into that thinking you will at some point, and it just never happens, you know. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about that, about how no matter how hard you try to protect the people you love, ultimately it's just we're just all against the world, you know. And and we have to eventually release our children into that. That's the most terrifying thing ever. And I experienced that when they went to kindergarten, and then when they went to middle school, and then when they went to high school and college, and now they're doing the workforce. It just, it never ends, you know? So um, that was one of the main, uh, the, maybe the main thesis in my mind is that sense of powerlessness. And I was mostly operating in that. I was also operating in um, the idea of empathy. Um, so I had the book completely finished and uh, by the early summer of 2015, when marriage equality happened, I rewrote the whole book because it just thematically it fit too well. And these uh, themes of parenthood and empathy, and uh, it's also a very theological book. So I really wanted to examine that from every angle, and I wanted to look at uh, people from every different way of being, and especially every way of belief and challenge myself to not make a caricature of anybody, all the way from the fanatical evangelical who's holding a gun to her son's head because he's gay, all the way to uh, the person who believes in something but she doesn't quite know what to call it, you know, and, and look at that spectrum. Also, I really wanted to look at all the different ways of, of, of Southern, being Southern, and what that means and what people think that means and how people think that's one big clump instead of lots of individual ways of being, you know. Um, as an Appalachian writer, something I talk a lot about is that there are many Appalachians um, and people don't think that. They think there's just one Appalachian. So um, anyway, I will turn it over to you all. I hope, I hope you'll talk to me. <laughs> Question? Always takes just a minute. <laughs> yes. Okay. I like the way that you see all these different people's feelings about something that's really um, timely right now. But there's no way that I believe, considering where you're from, you didn't get some flack from somebody or some group or maybe some religious affiliation. Mm -hmm. As a writer, how do you deal with that? Well, when my very first book came out, it divided the whole community, you know, and so I learned right from the get-go I could never please everybody and I might as well not try, you know, and that I, I really just wanted to write the book that I wanted to read. And, um, and, and I really love writing books that cause a conversation to happen, you know, and so that's one thing about this book is, um, at lots of my events, I have not been totally preaching to the choir, and I like that because I don't want to write a book that's just everybody's, you know, I want somebody to be changed while reading the book or evolve in some way or find something that really, that really resonates with them. Um, so I guess every book I've had, people have been mad about some aspect of it, you know. When my first book came out, um, Half the people who read it said it was breaking all kinds of stereotypes and all this, and the other half said it was perpetuating stereotypes, you know? So I learned right away you can't win because everybody looks at things different. That's a good question, though. Don't worry about it, it's the answer. <laughs>
two separate books, but about the same people? Um, I can't really imagine that, but I can tell you that it didn't take much rewriting at all because everything was already in there, all those themes were in there. And so really all I was rewriting was, I changed the time period, you know, because I made the book as contemporary as it could be. Because the last half of the book takes place in uh, summer of 2016. That's about as current as you can get in today's publishing industry because they publish pretty slowly, you know. Um, and so really all I was doing was going in and folding in some of the actual news events you know and, and that's all, all of that stuff is really more between the lines than it's on the page anyway you know because i'm not i'm not writing a book about the issue i'm writing a book about the human story does that make sense um but i, I probably couldn't reimagine the book that way you know i just i can i lived with it for eight or nine years so it's so ingrained in me the way it is i saw a hand here something Mary. Told me more about the characters was your pretty brief explanation description of place. Mm -hmm. You know, both the pine trees and then the cars going by and the hotel room. And I started to think in your description of the of the nature, can you do it so well because you've lived it and you know it so well? Um well I lived it from the point of view of my character. You know, I mean, I, I had never been to Key West. When I was writing this book, I went there for the first time for the Key West Literary Seminar, and I thought, this is where he runs off to because it's so rich, it's so different. It's the total opposite of where he's, um, of where he's from. And so I just thought, from that point, I started experiencing everything instead of from Silas's point of view, I was thinking of it from Asher's point of view because I knew him, and so I knew how he would react to things. So when I'm working on a novel, I walk through the world like, like my characters, and I might you know, take off one character's coat and put on another so I can see from that. I really believe in method writing. The same way you hear people talk about method acting all the time, but I really believe in method writing. Jim, you had a question. Yes. Um, Realized there were a lot of tangled ends. And if you don't write a sequel, tangled ends. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, people you, when you think about when you think about Asher being in jail, and you think about that sweet gal. Which may or may not happen. That, yeah. uh, that sweet gal down in Key West, you know, and how Justin's gonna grow up. I hope you'll do a sequel. Yeah, he's um, he, he's predicting, so he didn't tell you the end. Um, well, I wanted to give I wanted to give you just enough to where you're in, in uh, where you sort of imagine what happens, and so I really like that idea of letting the reader be involved to that degree, to where they're sort of putting this thing and this thing together, and so I've tried to plan enough little things so you can. So you have the end, all that, you know. I don't want to tie it all up in a neat little bow, but I also don't want to leave you confused. And so I try to put as much in there as, as possible so that you know, um, that you can figure it out. But I'm, I don't know if I'll ever return to it. I already have two other novels in my head, you know, that, I'm, that I need to get to. I'll wait, I'll wait. <laughs> Thank I gotta you. say one more thing. Silas loves anything at all about his writing. He wrote a wonderful article in the Oxford American <coughs> last year about the Phipps family who lived down there on Smoky Creek near Silas. And the Phipps family came to Bristol in 1927 and sang with the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers at the Big Bang of Country Music. And Silas got to know the family share with the audience a little bit about what music means to you. There's so much of it here. It's hard to keep up with Silas because he writes for Garden and Gun. He writes for the Oxford American. He writes for Salon. He does op-eds in the New York Times. I, 
I could go on and on about how smart this old boy is. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But tell the audience, if you will, what music means to you. Well, I've just always been somebody, you know, I have, when I get up, I, the first thing I do is turn on the radio, and I, I listen to a lot of music all day, and uh, I usually don't listen to music on the radio, I listen to news on the radio, but um, the first thing I do when I'm creating the character is figure out the music they love, and that really informs me and, and helps me to figure them out in a, in a way, and especially in this book, each character has a, a musician that's clearly defined for them. <laughs> Um, so when I'm listening, when I'm writing the book, I'll listen to the same song hundreds of times, you know, when I'm writing the scene. So like the first chapter of this book is set completely to the song Rain by Patty Griffin. So I listen to it over and over and over again while I worked for years on this first chapter. Um, and I guess I've just always, you know, music's just been such a part of my world. And I'm also a music writer, so I spend time with musicians, and I just admire the craft so much. I think it's really important as an artist to look to other kinds of art. So when I'm working on a book, I surround myself with as much, you know, I look at, I listen to music, I, I read a lot of poetry. Um, I, re I read the whole history of Key West, even though it's only set there for one summer. You know, it was important for me to know as much as I could. I look at a lot of photographs. I watch a lot of films. Um, th there's a, a film by Ingmar Bergman called Winterlight that was hugely influential on this book, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a term for that, I can't think of it right now. Who knows art inspired by other art? ex -phrases. yes. Yes. Uh, who, somebody else said, yeah. The scene where Asher encounters his brother Luke is, is so dramatic. It's, it's incredible. Did you envision that before you started the book? I mean, where in the process did you come up with that scene? Because it just seemed to kind of set up all the, the relationships and the theology. Mm -hmm. That scene was evolving right up to the end. You know, and some, some scenes I know right from the beginning where they're going to be, and, and some I'm working on right till the book goes to press. So every, I don't know why. Um, I think for me, that's probably the most important moment in the book. Um, and so that's probably the main reason it kept evolving, because as the theme got better defined for me, that scene became more important because so many things come together there. Yes. So, so when you write, do you know, like when you start writing, do you know the scene, you know what's going to happen throughout the book, or does it evolve as you write? I, no, I never know. I mean, some people do. Lee Smith always says she knows. She, you know, she knows pretty much everything, and I don't. I don't know anything. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I'm very impatient, and I don't think I could live eight years with a book if I knew. You know what I mean? I would get bored with it. But. <laughs> I'm only going to keep you about, but I know there's a big uh, 4th of July celebration around, so I don't want to keep y'all too long, but back here. Yes, it's not coincidence in the current Southern Living magazine that the book is Yeah, this book exists because of Lee Smith. But, I mean, in every way, she uh, you know, she was the first person to take me under her wing as a writer. And she's the reason I first went to Key West. She, uh, she was instrumental in me being invited to that literary seminar. And, um, and then one of my favorite things ever written by Lee Smith is maybe one of her least read things. It's called Live Bottomless, and it's set in Key West. If you don't know it, read it. It's in the book, uh, News of the Spirit. It's a novella. It's just beautiful. Have you read that, Amy? A long time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned other forms of art. Is there another form of art that inspired you? Uh, one of your biggest inspirations? 
situation. Uh, that's such a hard question. I mean, the thing that helps me to write more than anything is being, I mean, it sort of sounds so precious, but it's being outside. I, you know, I really am always seeking a body of water, for one thing. I'm really lucky where I live because you walk down our backyard and there's a, a holler, no other word for it, and you, you come out into like a pasture and then there's a big creek that runs through there. And so every day that I possibly can, I make that walk to that creek. And in between there, I'm formulating scenes, you know, and I'm working on all that. Um, so I guess that's that's the, the best way I can say that walking and being outside. I, I ride almost exclusively on my front porch as long as I possibly can until it's too cold for me to do it, you know. No matter how hot it is, I'm out there always. I, I can take the heat there and I can the cold. So I like being outside, that's the main thing. And I mean, you know, just watching humanity is an endless source of inspiration. I'm just endlessly fascinated by people. Um, so when I'm out, you know, I go out to eat, I'm engaged in the conversation with the people with me, but I'm also watching everything else in the room. And I'm, if there's anything that's, you know, I know I can use, I'm storing that away. So I think that's the way a writer has to live, you know, you just, through the world that way. I would love to take questions one-on-one -on -one, um, and uh, I'd love to sign you for your books. You don't have to have a book to ask me a question though, just come talk to me. Again, I appreciate so much y'all coming out on a, such a pretty day. Thanks so much. There will be refreshments over here. Uh, not only do we have Southern books, but we have paperback copies of Silas's other books. So form a line this way and down here so you don't interfere with the 